there's really not that many secrets left in football. You know, there's so many resources out there. And what you do does matter. You know, the, the schemes that you have trying to give your players an advantage, but how you do it matters more. And that all comes from the vision that you have. I've always taken this time of year to really look back at what we're doing and what we want to do moving forward. And it's a process. And that's what Nick Sheridan, who is now the tight ends coach for Washington, he was the offensive coordinator at Indiana, shares in this presentation, which he gave at the Illinois High School Football Coaches Association Clinic. This is the first part of his clinic where he goes through step by step how he thinks about putting an offense together. I think there are a ton of takeaways here, some things to take notes on that will help you at this time of the year, help you evaluate where you've been and where you're going. So here's Coach Sheridan. Be sure to check out the show notes for the link to this entire presentation. Building an offense, just some thoughts here that I just wanted to kind of touch about, some things to consider, okay? And this is a great time of the year to reflect on where you're headed, you know, especially, and obviously this talk is more directed towards offensive coaches and quarterbacks and, and other offensive position coaches. But, you know, I think it's important that when you're putting together your offense and you're trying to organize your offense, that you create a vision and you really spend some good quality time of thinking about what do you want to look like when you run out there on Friday nights or Saturday or Sunday, or whenever your game is, you know, what is the vision that you have? And that's, that's from whether you're a head coach, you know, what you want your team to look like if you're a coordinator each side of the ball, or even if you're a position coach, you know, what do you want your players and your film to look like? Spend time thinking about that. I think that's really important. What you do matters, but how you do it matters more. You know, I think there's a lot of people who run zone schemes, gap schemes, verticals, crossers. There's really not that many secrets left in football. You know, there's so many resources out there. And what you do does matter. You know, the, the schemes that you have trying to give your players an advantage, but how you do it matters more. And that all comes from the vision that you have. And I think that's really important. And I think the principles that you create from your vision will ultimately guide your decisions. It'll ultimately help you in good and bad times on how you want to operate. So I do think when you're putting together your offense or your defense or your team or your, or whatever, having a vision for a very clear, specific, detailed out vision for how you want your tape to look, how you want your position or group to play, I think that'll help you. You know, I think everybody knows that you want to play hard and execute, but I think specifically the things that are most important to you that when you turn the film on the day after the game, Saturday morning or Sunday morning or whenever it is, that you want to see show up. And I think creating a vision is really important. And I think this is a great time to reflect on that. And it's also got to show up. You know, I think there's been times I've been places or even myself as a coach, you know, you create a vision and then you don't enforce it. You don't, you don't support it. You don't promote it. And it doesn't show up. They're just words. So I think this is a great time of the year to really look back and reflect on, okay, what's our vision? How do we want to play? And is that, are those things showing up? And maybe you say certain things, but it's not happening. Okay. Why that is find those answers, ask those hard questions. But I think from the start, you know, before you decide the plays and the scheme is just a big picture vision of the things that you want to see on your tape. I also think, and I think this is really critical. I think it's really important when you're putting your offense together and organizing your offense is that you sell that vision. If you're a coordinator, you got to sell it to the staff. And if you're an assistant coach, you got to sell it to your players. You got to get them to believe in what you're doing and why you're doing that. And you create that belief. Because like I said, everybody's going to run certain types of plays. You know, there's, if you go through almost every college program, many, most high school programs, everyone's going to run an inside zone play. How you do that, creating that belief amongst the players so that they bring it to life, I think is really important. You got to spend time doing that. You got to show video together. You got to promote the things that you want and creating that belief with what you're doing and how you're trying to do it, I think is critical when you're putting it together. So what are the standards and expectations for the staff, for the players from the very first day that the offseason program starts? You know, I have a couple notes here that I just touched on, but I do think, you know, I heard a coach talk about this in the past as far as when you have high standards and you have high expectations, it certainly dictates the way that you operate. It certainly impacts the way that you handle your business. You know, when you expect to win, when you expect 
to be on time and you expect to do things at a high level. And when you hold each other to that standard, it changes the way that you operate. And I know these are simple things, but I think they're really important. I don't think as coaches, you want to take them for granted. I think they matter. And I think creating those standards and expectations from the minute that the kids walk in the door to start the offseason program, I think is critical. And I think reestablishing those because it's a it's a moving target. You know, it's a new group of guys. You might have new staff members. You might whatever it may be. The leaders that were there last year aren't there this year. So I think as you're getting going in your offseason, creating those standards and expectations from the beginning matters. And I think a foundational principle that I've tried to use with the players that I've had a great opportunity to coach is that we don't make excuses. I put on their production versus performance. And I think this ties into making excuses. So, you know, production is numbers to me. Like when people say there's been great production, you're looking at yards, points, carries, catches, touchdowns, et cetera. That's production. And certainly we all recognize that the higher, you know, the more you produce, the better, you know, the product is, I get all that. Okay. But your performance individually has nothing to do with your production. And I think that's really important for young people to understand because just take a wide out, for example. Everybody understands that a wide receiver can't have production without a quarterback that can throw it to him or a line that can throw it to him. But you might not have good production, but that does not mean that your performance can't be at a high level. And that's something to me that you can control. That's a standard and an expectation that my performance is going to be irregardless of what type of production I get. And when you take that approach, right, because it's very easy amongst a team, you can blame other positions or you can justify a lack of production on other people. But your performance, how you perform has nothing to do with the other positions. If I'm a quarterback, Taking the right drop and taking the right footwork and making the right reads has nothing to do with the lines block or the wide receivers route. Now the production might, the production might be impacted by that, but not the performance. So I think separating those two things for each individual on your team is important because the goal is to perform at a high level. And when you do that collectively, then the production comes. We recognize that in football that it's it takes all 11. But, you know, you don't make excuses for a lack of production. You don't worry about that. You just focus on the performance and you can control that. And I think that's really important. I think that's there's there's a difference there. And I just wanted to share that with you guys. I think that the, the making of excuses goes for staff members as well. I think as a staff, OK, you're going to ask your players to execute things perfectly or not at all. You're not going to have an in-between ground, guys. You're not going to kind of do things well or we played pretty good. You either did it perfectly or we're not going to do it. It goes back to creating the high standards and expectations from the very first day. You're going to ask your players to execute things perfectly or you're not going to do it. You're not going to kind of sort of block the guy or kind of sort of get open. We're either going to execute the job. We're going to make the right reads. We're going to take the right footwork. And we're going to have high standards and high expectations to that. I think how you talk matters, how you think matters. Creating the mindset, which certainly applies to the standards and expectations, is critical. And thinking and seeking high performance and getting players to talk that way and think that way, I think is really important. you got to spend time on that. This is just – it's called the Pygmalion effect. I stole this. Obviously, guys, I, I'm, I, didn't, I didn't make any of this stuff. But, you know, your beliefs ultimately impact your actions. I always use the analogy with coaches, like a strength coach, for instance, strength and conditioning, performance, those types of things. They're just trying to improve the athlete. They don't care whether or not the guy can block or tackle. or They don't care, right? Freshman football player comes into your strength program. If you're one of the strength coaches, you're just trying to help that kid get stronger. And whether it produces an All-American or not, you know, you can look at the, the improvement. I think sometimes as coaches, you can be impacted by the quality of player you think you have. That can change the way you coach them. And that's why I always, I always try as a coach to have a strength coach mentality in the sense that we're just trying to get everybody as good as they possibly can. And we believe genuinely that they all can improve. And we don't know what that ceiling is. And we're going to coach them as hard as we can and pour into them regardless if on the back end of it, we get an all-conference player or not. And if you take that mindset and approach, I think your group will improve dramatically. Not just the best players, but the whole group, which ultimately impacts the team. So I just offer that up to you. Because if you think a player is not going to be that good of a player for you in the long run, there probably won't be. Because that will change how you coach them. 
subconsciously. You won't make a decision say, I'm not going to coach that kid that hard, but it just happens naturally. So I think a genuine belief that every player can improve and that you don't you don't put a cap or a ceiling on that player, I think that's the way that you got to go about it. And that's hard, right? Everybody sees the the real talented athletic freshmen in their program and they want to spend a little bit extra time. But I would encourage you, like I said, take the approach of a strength coach. They just try to get everybody in the program stronger. They just try to get everybody in shape. You know, they're not looking at stars or rankings or projections. They just try to get everyone as big and fast and strong, explosive and healthy as possible. I think as a football coach, you need to take the same approach and throw. So I just want to share that with you. I think that ties into the high standards and high expectations and the belief and how that impacts your actions. Building a common language, you put together your offense. I think that's really important. How are we going to talk? How are we going to see things? I use this as a small example, right? Okay, so MOFC, middle of field close. You could say one high. You could say single safety defense. You, sh- you could say post safety defense. You know, is it a two I or a G, right? Is it a six technique or a set? I mean, there's so many different languages out there in football. I think building a common language so that everybody is on the same page is really important and making sure that that language is consistent and that the guys understand it. Now, you may not feel like defining, you know, one high versus single safety versus post safety because they're all they're all they mean the same thing. You might not feel like that's critical and that's fine. But I do know that there are certain things that really matter. Right. And you got to decide what that is for your group of players, for your system of football whatever you're doing, but building a common language. And again, this is just an example of a defensive ID. It could be, we make sure the tackle tight end combination on a scheme that will appear in the same thing that the tight end. Is. And so we got to have a common language there. We got to make sure that if we're teaching four verts, that whatever middle open or middle close or one high, two high, that the wide out is hearing the same thing that the quarterback is. And that list can go on and on. And so building a common language, creating that glossary, I think is really productive. I really do. And I've been a part of places where we did a good job of that. And I've been a part of places where we could have done better. And I would encourage you during this time, it's a great time to do it. And to really think critically about the words that you use when trying to teach the game and trying to communicate the game amongst the staff. So I think this is a great time to do that. I think that's important. Base fundamentals. When I look at offensive football, and my dad's a line, linebacker coach by trade. He's coached D-line. He's coached secondary. My little brother's a defensive coordinator. I mean, I come – I don't know how I wound up on offense, but I learned how to tackle at a young age, okay? And on defensive football, there's always been a very clear cut. These are the fundamentals of defense, whether it's block destruction or tackling or takeaways, et cetera, okay? Ball destructions, all those types of things, okay? On offense, I think these are the things that matter, okay? Clearly – we have to secure the football. How are we teaching that? How are we defining that? What are the buzz terms that we're using as a staff, as a program? Now's a great time to make sure that everyone's on the same page. We got to block a certain way. Now, the blocks that the wide receivers have to perform and the left guard has to perform might be slightly different. Certainly, we all recognize that. But the principles of it can be very similar relative to hand placement, leverage, bend, et cetera. Whatever those things are, I think now's a great time to define it as a group. I, I call it the exchange ball exchange, right? So you have different layers to that. Catching a football is an exchange of, a, of the ball. Handing the ball off, obviously, is an exchange of the ball, right? A ball goes from one player to the next. That is a fundamental. How are we teaching that? What are the key coaching points? Is the tight end coach and the wide out coach running the same type of drills? Are we circuit training that? What are the things we're doing in our program to make sure that guys are hearing things repetitively over the course of time so that they can improve on it? And the last thing is throwing. Obviously, I I think it's a fundamental. You know, if you want to be a good offense, you have to be able to throw the football. Obviously, that's more unique and specific to the quarterbacks. But when you think about these things, I think it's important that you define it. And then how are we drilling it as a program? Most places have ball security circuits. Some places have ball drills, right? Is it program wide? Is it position to position? How are we trying to drill those things so that we're all on the same page and that we're seeing improvement in those areas? Because the game still is simple. It still comes down to doing the small things well. And I think these are, this is the nuts and bolts of it. Now there's different types of blocks. There's different types of traffic you could find yourself in relative to catching the ball or securing the ball. There's different types of throws. But when you look at these things, big picture, I think these are the key fundamentals of offensive football. And now's a great time to try to define it and drill it.
about creating a common language. I think communication is critical. Okay. I, think, I mean, it is it's so important for our sport to communicate at a high level. And I also think that the verbal communication and the nonverbal communication that happens on a day-to-day basis with kids these days is a lot less than what it used to be. And I'm not that old and I, I, I've been a part of, you know, social media and all those of things. But, you know, you think about, I can remember when, when I was in college, we never, we never played music during when we left it. We just didn't play music. It just wasn't really occasionally, but very few times. So what ended up happening during the workouts, we actually talked to one another. Now you have music blaring. And I understand that too. I get, I get that, you know, trying to create a, an environment of excitement, of energy, all those things. I, I get that. But it certainly takes away from communication. That's just one example, right? Architects more than they call. They Snapchat, you, all those things, right? Making sure that your kids communicate clearly, loudly, directly at the person they need to communicate with, I think is really important. There's also communication, coach to coach, coach to player, player to coach, player to player. We all know that. I think it has to be simple. You don't want to be communicating in a sport of football in sentences. You certainly want to be communicating in buzz terms, okay? Both with the players and the coaches. The lines of communication need to be simple. So on offense, this is just an example, you have the play caller. The play caller calls the play. Then that gets communicated from the signalers, right? So you go play caller to signalers, signalers to the players and what has to happen before the snap. So whether you have a system of everyone's receiving a signal from the sideline, first got to relay something, run backs got whatever it is, guys, the communication is critical. Your system of communication must be simple and it has to be able to be understood and done at a high level. And obviously we know there's verbal and nonverbal communication. So maybe your signal system is not clean enough, clear enough. Maybe we have too many signals. Maybe we have too many terms. Can our kids, do our kids process it properly? Is it as simple as it needs to be? I think this is a great time when you're putting your offense from, from ground zero or evaluating the things you do. I think these are things that matter. Simple is better. I, I believe that. I've been a part of different types of offenses, real long play calls. I can remember, shoot, when I was in college, still to this day, speed break Detroit, right upside, 300 box, Y stick, X Omaha, kill 358, X slush. That was long, guys. I mean, we had to read it off of a play card. I had bad eyesight. My mom's mad at me. I'm always squinting on TV. Making it simple as possible, I think, is important. And the game at each level is a little bit different, guys. So the game in the NFL is different. They could get a guy on a Monday that's got to play for them on a Sunday. So it would make sense to say why stick X Omaha, right? That would make sense because the guy's got, okay, I'm the X, I got the Omaha, whatever it may be, guys. But the goal is not to make it as confusing as possible. Simple is better. Each week, you got to get good at something and you got to commit to that because what's going to happen for most of us is you're going to play somebody that's really good and maybe they stop you. You have a bad game, you have a bad series, and it's very easy to question what you're doing. Commit to it. Because over the course of time, you might have a bad game early in the year. So you're a defensive coach. You're playing cover four. Someone throws post in. So you say, well, we can't run. You know, you get bombed. You get hit for a seven-yard touchdown. We can't run quarters anymore. Commit to it because by the time, no, we're just going to get better at cover four. And we're going to get the safety in the corner to recognize the split, whatever, right? And same on offense because over time as the year progresses, when you commit to the things that you want to get good at, you'll get good at them. So I think that's really important. The repetition in the fundamentals, the repetition in the techniques, the repetition in the coaching points, even if you hit some road bumps along the way, if you stick to the principles and the vision that you established at the beginning, I think you'll get good at something. I think that matters. You know, I have these as examples, right? Like when I was a high school kid, uh, we were in a wing T offense and I still, I could, I didn't even block. Okay. I still remember, when we ran the down series, it was gap down backer, right? That was a simple coaching point, simple rules for the for the players. It applied. It's, you know, here I am 20 years later, and I can still remember. And I, I haven't, you know, I haven't had to block a soul, but I still remember gap down backer. You know, you're running perimeter runs, right? We use the term PSA, which stands for Peak Scrape Alley, right? Over and over and over again, those are simple, good teachings. It's repetition and fundamental. It's a repetition techniques, rules, whatever it is. You're going to get good at it. I think that matters. Okay, scheme selection. What type of volume do we need? What is necessary for us to win the games that we need to win to compete for championships, right? You got to decide that. I think this is a great time to do that. Everybody, 
you know, um, has probably seen uh, Brian Billick's book and, and videos on game planning, right? And and being real specific as as far as how many times are you in the third downs? How many times are you in the open field? Now's a great time to look at that, right? Now's a good time to go back and say, gosh, dang, you know, we put in, you know, 35 short third and one plays and, you know, we never even got to half of them. Okay, let's trim it down. Let's look at what we need and, and let's let's identify the volume. You know, what's the strengths of our players? Every year that starts over, right? What can our kids do well? And I think the ability to adapt year in and year out is what great offensive coaches, great coaches in general do. So identifying the strengths. Maybe our line's more athletic this year and last year they were more powerful, whatever it may be. Because, you know, at the high school level, obviously you're – you got who you got, you know, maybe the 10th grade class is real big and strong. The ninth grade class is more athletic, whatever. You you know, we're not going to run the same plays every year necessarily if our kids can't do it. So identifying what your kids do well, I think that's, that that's important. You know, who do you have to be, right? Who's in your league and who do you have to be? What do they do on defense? Be specific. We're putting in our offense. We got all these cool runs and then, all of a sudden, weeks one through four, we're playing an odd team, and we don't have any odd runs that we like. You know, everything that we put in has been versus four down. Or, you know, we're playing our defense all off season, and they're a three deep team, and we got every curl, flat, four vert, slant, arrow. We got them all right. In the first game, we play a Tampa two team. We don't have any type of a smash or a high low, right? So, being specific as far as what you have to be, who are you playing, what do they do, any issues that come up, and then look at it. Okay. We like these plays. Are these plays good against what we're going to see in the fall? And um, I think that'll guide you and help you when you're selecting what schemes to run. In today's age of coaching, there is so much access to information. It's awesome. I mean, you know, I was talking to Keith. I mean, the, the access to just super smart coaches at all of these clinics has been spectacular here in the last year or so. But – the things that you may not know, you know, you, you might not know what's what's really the nuts and bolts just because you listen to a 45 minute, you know, to an hour clinic. Right. What are you an expert at? You know, what can you as a coach really teach and create that belief amongst the players and identify that? And if you get it going through your process of selecting the schemes and you just love outside zone, but you're not an expert on it. Go become one. The resources out there and the access to people is unbelievable. You know, if you really want to run certain schemes, you can. But I would encourage you to become an expert at those things before you just say, hey, let's just run these plays because, you know, we saw the Rams run it and it looked cool. You know, make sure that you know why they're doing it, what they're doing it against. You know, what's really the techniques and coaching points. And don't be afraid to step out of the box and try new things. But I do think identifying what you're an expert at as a coach to where you have the comfort and confidence to be able to weather the storms when it does get, you know, rocky relative to the plays you're running. And then the last thing I would say when you're selecting the scheme is what makes you unique? You know, what makes you challenging to defend? And there's a lot of answers to that. Maybe you're a huddle team. Maybe that's your, you know, nobody in our league huddles. That could be your niche. You know, we are a wing T team and everybody in our league is spread or, you know, whatever it may be, some, we're unbalanced. We run a ton of unbalanced. We're a quarterback run team. We are a empty team. We are a bunch team. Whatever it might be, make sure you have things that make you unique and tough to prepare for. I think that's important when you're deciding which schemes to run. And you have the time to, to really evaluate it this time of the year, and I think, I think uh, it's worth your while. Okay, create a process and a plan, okay? I think this is one of the things that I've learned the most here in my coaching career is having a process and a plan for as many things as you can, because we all go through the year, you have ebbs and flows of the year, right? And fall back on your process. I put that on there as adversity and prosperity. Regardless of whether you're having success or you're not, go back to the process. It, it's, 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 it just is kind of a, it grounds you. It, it, it directs you, it guides you. And, what is that for you? You know, what is your daily process? What is your weekly process? How do you reach decisions? How do you make adjustments in game, in between series, in between games, in between practices, whatever it may be, right? Have a process, evaluate that process. And then no matter whether it's good or bad, you know, it's sound, you know, it's proven, lean on it.
and it'll help you. Process over results. I just put that on you. That was a, a, a picture that I saw. I always, that's what it is, guys. Lean on your process. Just because it's going bad doesn't mean that, you know, you, you don't know what you're doing. I'm not saying you're stubborn. I'm not saying you're not willing to adjust, but focus on your process. There's a reason why you're either playing well or you're not, and lean on that. That's a very well thought out and sound process that Coach Sheridan shared with us today. Again, that entire talk is available on CoachTube in the Illinois High School Football Coaches Association store. Be sure to check that out. The link is in the show notes. If you go there now, there's a savings of 50% on that one. Be sure to follow all we're doing at coachandcoordinator.com and follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.